Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you for coming this morning on behalf of uh, John Hamry and the CSIS. And I know you came to hear Ambassador Sumedai, and I will not take up more than a few moments. But I think it is particularly important at this point in time to hear an Iraqi voice. Sometimes I feel that we in the United States tend to debate issues purely in our own terms. And I know many of you have not had the opportunity to visit Iraq, but it is a country I first visited in the early 70s, and I can never forget the fact that it is today a country of 27 million people, that the events there go far beyond the issue of U.S. surges and U.S. troop levels. It is also a country which has an extraordinarily young population, when we talk about the future of Iraq, it's easy to forget that the median age of Iraqis is about 19 years, about half the median age of Americans. And the future we are shaping affects literally an immense number of people. I think, too, that as we have our own debate in the United States, we as Americans may find it a little too easy to forget that we have moral and ethical obligations to the Iraqis and to the Iraqi people, not simply strategic interests. And I can't think of someone better qualified to express the Iraqi view than the ambassador. He has served as a minister. He was an active member of the resistance to Saddam Hussein. He's been Iraq's ambassador to the United Nations before becoming the ambassador to the United States. I find out he is also a poet and a calligrapher, someone who knows the culture of his country and his heritage as well as the politics. So, Ambassador, if I may turn things over to you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kurtzman, for this uh, introduction, and thank you for arranging this meeting. Um, I'll go uh, straight into my comments. There is a heartfelt debate going on in this country about what to do about Iraq. People feel that this intervention in Iraq uh, is not producing any successes to speak of. It's uh, bogged down. It's a big drain on American resources. And it's going nowhere. And are wondering when this is all coming to an end. It's a legitimate question, it's a legitimate worry. And we understand, of course, why Americans generally feel so disappointed and uh, so exasperated with the situation in Iraq. But in my many speaking engagements around the country, I find the American public especially those with an interest in international affairs, to be quite willing to listen. They ask the right questions, and when they are informed, they generally are very supportive. What I'd like to do uh, in my brief remarks today is to put the Iraqi situation in its context, in a context that helps the American public, the American decision makers, to look at it not as a problem, or not just as a problem, but also as an opportunity, and uh, see the longer term ramifications of various decisions and policy approaches. Iraq has not always been a problem. 
everybody knows Iraq, Mesopotamia is the birthplace of civilization. It is where most people uh, agree the wheel was invented, the week was invented as a unit of time, beer was first brewed, the first ever law was written, the first ever library was public library was established and the first ever cooking recipe was written. Iraq has a very long tradition and a long civilization. And it, in its modern incarnation, it came up as a modern state in the 20s of last century. And I myself was born into a middle class family. My parents took care that I had a good education. Uh, people in Baghdad were very neighborly, very peaceful. Violence was far from people's minds. People tended their gardens and looked after their own. And corruption was almost unheard of. People who, uh, when rumor was uh, going around that someone was involved in corruption, he was shunned and this is how we grew up. There was no discrimination and no um, prejudice as to Sunni, Shia, Kurd, Christian, Muslim, Jew. Uh, many people forget that Baghdad in the 30s of the last century was largely a Jewish uh, city. It was about 25% to 30% of its population uh, was Jewish. Uh, the first parliament in Iraq had more Jewish members than Christian members. So Iraq and Baghdad in particular was a cosmopolitan country which was coming up, coming up very well. Uh, up till the 50s and when uh, the first coup d'etat, military coup, took place, Iraq was a very promising country. When the Ba'athists came in 1968, Iraq had foreign reserves of $35 billion. Its GDP was on a par with Spain. It was, the education system was working, the health system was working. And uh, it was very, a very promising country with people looking forward to the future. Iraqi dinar was equivalent to 3.3 American dollars. When finally in 2003, after two wars and a long period of sanctions, Saddam was removed, the economy had collapsed completely. One dollar became equal to about 3,000 Iraqi dinars. And instead of having a surplus and a reserve, Iraq was in the red to the tune of 300 or 350 billion dollars. That is the transformation. That's the transformation that Saddam and his misrule and his henchmen with systematic looting, systematic destruction wreaked on the country. But the figures belie a deeper reality of destruction destruction in social values, destruction in social fabric. Um, the corruption that took root, the government institutions that became totally dysfunctional. Um, I think it is true to say that the state as a state had collapsed from the inside during the period of the sanctions. The sanctions were almost as responsible for the destruction of the state and the social fabric as the misrule and, and, and the crimes of Saddam Hussein. So enter the United States 2003. Maybe without sufficient thinking about how to manage the situation, Saddam, Saddam's regime collapsed as it was expected to. But there was a period of lawlessness, and a period of lack of control, which 
we are still paying for until now. The police and the army were disbanded, and there was absolutely no uh, uh, impediment to mob rule. Saddam had very thoughtfully released thousands upon thousands of hardened criminals into the streets before the Americans intervened. So in that environment, the average person, uh, average civilian, was really in trouble. Nevertheless, Iraqis rallied. Most Iraqis were delighted to get rid of Saddam. They were grateful for the Americans to rid them of Saddam. But they were look, looking forward to a better future. We're hoping that the Americans will help them put their country together and build their institutions. But in this vacuum, two things happened. Regional powers found an opportunity to step in and establish spheres of influence. And of course, uh, insurgents and criminals, organized crime, and uh, all kinds of bad people found an opportunity to organize themselves. And with help and support, tangible and significant help from outside, they succeeded in doing that. We must remember that Saddam experienced a failure early in his political career. In, in the Ba'ath Party was, came to power in 1963 and was removed in the same year. He came to power in February, were removed in November of the same year, only to come back in 1968. But they vowed that if ever they are removed, they would have enough resources to come back. And they set aside for many years 5% of the oil revenue as a fund to help them to come back. Like any good disciplined mafia, they dispersed these funds through many legitimate businesses internationally. And the equity which is controlled by Saddam's family and his supporters is in the tens of billions of dollars. So they are not exactly short of cash. Saddam, before being removed, sent his son to the central bank to load up nearly $2 billion in cash. Three truck loads were loaded up and moved out. We managed to retrieve something like $500 million, just a pocket change compared to what they have. So what the point I am making here is that we have the Saddamists with, with the determination to come back to power and the necessary resources. They are supported, aided and abetted by regional powers who were less than pleased by the intervention of the United States and the presence of United States troops next to them. And we had the vacuum which allowed all these things to get established. So we have this formidable challenge. But the Iraqi people rose up to the challenge despite the onslaught. And it has been a horrendous onslaught. To date, there have been about a thousand suicide bombers who have attacked Iraq. You tell me any country on the face of earth which can withstand a thousand suicide bombers going into markets, going next to schools, going wherever there is a crowd and blowing themselves up. It is, it is remarkable how resilient Iraqis are. And until now, and yesterday there was an attack on parliament, 
Today, there was a meeting of defiance in the in Parliament. People constantly, whether in going to um, uh, vote in, 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 in the elections or going to their jobs every day, they are in, in every action saying to the terrorists, we are no, not going to be cowed. I have lost many dear friends in this battle, and I don't know any other Iraqi who has worked with me who has not. Last month, our vice president was here, and we were sitting in the Oval Office with President Bush, and I know that he had shrapnel in his body still from the attack a month before to assassinate him. This is what we are going through. But I detected no uh, weakening, I detected no change in resolve in Dr. Adil Abdel Mahdi's attitude or anybody else. Iraqis are still determined to go on. However, the extent of the damage in Iraq that, that, that has accumulated because of all these factors that I have enumerated, and the viciousness and, and a, a sheer scale of the onslaught upon them means that this is going to be a long drawn battle. But this is not only a battle in Iraq by Iraqis. It's an international battle. This is a confrontation between forces going well beyond Iraq, well beyond Iraqi borders. Most of the suicide bombers I mentioned a while ago are not Iraqi. They're coming to us from North Africa, they are coming to us from Yemen, from Sudan, even from Europe. So we have been thrust into this situation by the intervention of the United States, for which we are grateful. Let's, let me make that absolutely clear. But to get out of, out of it, we cannot do it on our own. Yet the debate in this country is, seems to be always framed in when can we have the troops back? Is it next month or is it the month after? I say that it should not be framed in these terms. I say that it should be framed in terms of this confrontation with this international alliance of dark forces. Are we, and by we I mean here both Americans and Iraqi, and all those who believe in democracy, all those who value the values of open society. Are we going to come out as defeated or are we going to come out on top? That's the fundamental principle that we have to keep in our minds. And we have to do, we all have to do whatever it takes to ensure that Iraq does not fall into the hands of Al-Qaeda or the Saddamists, or an alliance of both, or an alliance between them and other extremist uh, 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 Islamist uh, movement, or become dismembered between all these and between regional powers. That would be a catastrophe not only for Iraq, it would be a catastrophe for the region, and it would be, I insist, a catastrophe for the United States and its long-term interests. I believe everything that needs to be done has to be done. We Iraqis have not been sitting idle. We've made considerable achievements in the fire. We continue to do so, and we will continue to do so. Many people talk about sectarian violence and that there is a civil war. There is a, a war, indeed, but it's not a civil war. It's a war conducted, carried out by extremists on innocent civilians. Extremist Sunnis are killing innocent Shia. Extremist Shias are killing innocent Sunnis. But there is no animosity between ordinary Sunnis and Shias. They live quite happily together. They work quite happily together. And I, and, 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 you know, as an Iraqi, I know that in, in my own experience and the experience of all the Iraqis I know, there is no hatred. 
We are not the Balkans. People try to balkanize Iraq, but Iraq cannot be balkanized. We cannot... Uh, the, the Iraqis don't warm up to solutions, in inverted commas, about dividing the country in order to, uh, uh, to, to keep it together. This, this would not work. We have big pockets of uh, Shia uh, communities within Sunni areas, and we have big pockets of Sunni areas within Shia areas. We have, in urban society, we have uh, about 30% of mixed marriages. What do we do? Run the borders through bedrooms? It wouldn't work. In Iraq, it would not work. So to those who are seeking simple solutions, I say, forget it. We Iraqis will find our own solutions. We Iraqis will reach the accommodations that will work for us. Help us to beat off the terrorist. And help us to rebuild our institutions which were destroyed over years of misrule, sanctions, and then later mismanagement. Then we will shoulder our responsibilities. We believe we, believe we can do it, but we believe we can do it only with your help. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to open things up for questions in just a moment. I do have several favors to ask, however. We do have microphones. I would be grateful if you would wait for them. Uh, I'm staring into some TV lights, so I'm going to have to recognize you largely by geography, not by name. Uh, forgive me for doing that, but that means it would be very helpful if you'd identify yourself before you ask your question. And since we have quite a number of people here, if we could make it one single question per person and one that ends in a question mark, uh, that would probably make it better for everyone. Uh, let me begin with the lady in the far back there. Michelle Kellerman with National Public Radio. Um, was wondering, you talked a lot about the influence of neighbors. If you can um, shed some light on the upcoming neighbors meeting, why it's taking so long to get it off the ground, um, what are your expectations for it? Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't think it's taking so long to get it off the ground. We, uh, it needed some uh, nimble uh, diplomacy to get the first one going, and that was uh, that took place, as you know, in Baghdad on the 10th of uh, March at uh, senior official level. Uh, that meeting uh, requested the Iraqi foreign minister to conduct discussions with all participants to set up a date and a place for the next meeting, which is at ministerial level, and give him a month to do so. And he, in fact, did it within the month, just. But he did it, uh, and uh, it has been now agreed uh, to hold the ministerial level meeting on the 4th of May, uh, which is soon going to be upon us. Uh, that would be preceded by a meeting on the Iraq compact. But this is a very significant meeting. We have always pleaded with our neighbors uh, to leave us alone and, 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 allow, and uh, allow Iraq to heal uh, without intervention and without interference. Uh, and we have warned them that if, if, if things go wrong in Iraq, they will not be immune from the violence and they will not be immune from the terrorism that would overflow from Iraq. We received a lot of assurances and promises, but we generally try to hold people to their word and, uh, and judge them by what they actually do, not by what they say. Uh, this forthcoming meeting will be one in, a, in the context of a chain of such meetings, but this will be more important and, and, and different in, the, in that uh, the P5, the permanent five members of the 
Security Council will participate at ministerial level. It will be an opportunity for uh, the big, big powers to be talking to the regional powers. And uh, hopefully this will help uh, address uh, confrontations that exist at the moment between uh, the various parties. And if we can diffuse these confrontations and reduce them, that would be reflected in, uh, in the streets of Baghdad and other Iraqi cities. Thank you. Well, Iraq and Iran uh, are implicitly there because Iran is a regional power and the U.S., of course, is, is going to be attending. Uh, in back yes very good Kathy Landry with class news service I was curious if you could talk about the oil situation in Iraq and whether you have any if you can give a realistic expectation of when the oil law will be passed and implemented and if you have any forecast for oil production um, as you know Iraq has uh, considerable oil reserves, uh, but its oil industry, like all other infrastructure, uh, are uh, running on shoestrings. Uh, they're dilapidated. We haven't built uh, a refinery in the last uh, 30, 40 years in Iraq. Uh, and it is subject to sabotage all the time. But despite the sabotage, we are producing around 1.7 and exporting around, uh, producing about uh, 2 million uh, barrels a day and uh, exporting about 1.7 uh, million barrels a day. But that's way below what we want to produce uh, and export. Uh, so there is the opportunity for considerable oil investment, uh, considerable investment in the uh, oil uh, sector. And uh, uh, we have also made sure in, in the drafting of our constitution that oil is uh, the property, if you like, or the benefit from oil belongs to all Iraqis. Uh, that is a very uh, useful and unifying principle for Iraq. And Recently, uh, the cabinet has passed a draft law to uh, put some flesh on that principle, and uh, that draft will be going to parliament. Uh, parliament will debate it, uh, possibly amend it or whatever, but uh, we expect that it will be changed. It, it, will, be, it will be passed. Uh, how long exactly... I don't know. This, we, we are, we are uh, in, as you know, in difficult times. Things take a little longer there. Think, th as you know, things take long enough here in <laughs> Washington, D.C. So don't expect more of us than uh, people do here in peaceful environment. But we, will, we, we, we realize how urgent this is, and, and this is being uh, dealt with uh, on that basis. Thank you. Uh, gentleman over there. Sir, uh, uh, could you identify yourself? Uh, James Kitfield from National Journal Magazine. Um, General Petraeus has talked about there's Iraqi time and there's and there's U.S. time, and the, the two clocks don't match up. Your comments seem to imply the same thing. You're sort of begging for a little more patience, not begging, but you're you're asking for more patience. What do you tell Democratic leaders on Capitol Hill when they say that they want to? Put a timetable for the for all U.S. forces that really goes through next year, but no, but no further. How do you respond to them? Well, I think I can claim uh, the, the first use of this uh, uh, phraseology of, uh, of clocks. And, and General Petraeus uh, has used it quite correctly. Um, there is a difference in. Uh, in the clock, if you like, in the speed of the clock in, uh, in Washington and in Baghdad. Uh, in Baghdad, we are governed by reality on how soon we can deliver any specific thing in the circumstances that we 
experience out there. Here, the imperatives are of uh, you know, presidential elections, uh, other elections, and what uh, different parties want to do it to each other. Uh, I think we should go, frankly, by what happens on the ground. The judgment, uh, the best judgment of that uh, it, it can be made uh, by uh, Iraqi government, which is, of course, uh, deeply involved, and uh, by uh, the U.S. Uh, forces and, and people like General Petraeus, who are experiencing things firsthand. Uh, uh, to, to those who um, say that by a certain date we should have a cutoff and bring the troops home, um, I think they uh, they would be saying to the uh, terrorists, "You don't have to do anything now; just wait until that date." Uh, that is not the right signal to send out. However, I'm not against discussing dates. I'm not uh, against setting deadlines or target dates for ourselves because we want to challenge ourselves. We want to achieve what we need to achieve. But this can be discussed not in the glare of publicity, not in public statements, and certainly should not be legislated. That, that should be a target that we both work towards on understandings or uh, tacit understandings between the two governments and everybody who is involved. That's the way this should be tackled. We agree on one thing. We don't want tens or tens of thousands of American troops to continue to exist on Iraqi soil forever. So if we can find a way of achieving that in a way that will not give victory to the terrorists and at the same time will, uh, uh, will uh, satisfy Americans who are worried about their loved ones. Gentlemen in the third row there, uh, please wait for the microphone. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, good morning to you. And good morning, Dr. Cordesman. My name is Edward Joseph. I'm with uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and uh, co-author with uh, Michael O'Hanlon of the Brookings Institution of just such a, a proposal, sir, that I think uh, you were criticizing before, and that is uh, federalism or uh, soft partition of, of uh, Iraq along the Bosnia model as a solution and as envisioned in the, uh, in the Iraq Constitution as a plan B, I should mention as a plan B if uh, present course does not work. And sir, you, you said, uh, and, and I, I take your point very well, that there's no, and it's a major counter argument to this kind of view, that uh, Sunni and Shia, there's no, it's not the Balkans, there's no animosity and hate there. You say that. Uh, on what, what we see, unfortunately, indicators are both Could we get to a I have a question, sir. I, please, permit me. I'm, I'm making, well, a, I think, a valid point, and I, I do have a question, I'm Dr. Cordesman, and believe me. Please get to I, it. I, I have it. Uh, if you'll permit me, I, I will get to it. Uh, we see uh, the uh, corrosive effect of the fighting that is uh, forcing people to flee into homogenous areas, increasingly homogenizing their country. We also see well, elections. I'm really we sorry. Also if see, you have a question, have a question please sir. get to it now, or uh, we'll go on to someone else. I will, sir. I'm get, I, I am. It's now. honestly a rather cogent point that I'm making, if you just yes, permit but me. but this is not a speech uh, for I understand. Opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the second thing is we see a longstanding sense of a Shiite uh, sense of grievance that's reflected in the election. And my question for you and for Dr. Cordesman, if he'd care to reply as well, is how do you see any valid Shiite alternative, particularly among the Shiites, to the course that we are suggesting? The argument is made that only Skiri and only Hakim want this course of action. But where do we see the evidence? And I ask either one of you, including the highly respected and has my respect, Dr. Cordesman, either one of you, where do you see the evidence of a Shiite vision that is different from this, that has the crucial 
component that, must, that Iraq must have for stability, which is a meaningful place for Sunnis. If people do not like the vision of Hakim right, and Skiri, really what is... Speech. What uh, is we'll allow the ambassador to respond, Thank please. Uh, Thank you. Uh, well, I said uh, moments ago that Iraq is not the Balkans. I said that what's going on is not a fight between Sunnis and Shia. Um, and I said that physically and geographically and socially, Iraqi Sunnis and Iraqi Shia are very intermingled. Yes, there has been uh, intimidation by extremists. There, have been, there has been murders committed by extremists. Large numbers in the case of uh, Sunni extremists in the form of Al-Qaeda and Saddamists and so on started in 2003 with, when they murdered uh, uh, Muhammad Bakr al-Hakim. About a hundred of his people as they were coming out of prayers in Najaf. And continued relentlessly. But throughout that period, the Shia and their, and their visionary uh, religious leaders saw through this. They, 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 they saw clearly the strategy of the terrorists. The terrorists, Zarqawi, in fact, put it down in black and white in his famous letter, which was intercepted. He said that we need to start a civil war between Sunni and Shia in order to achieve our purpose. The Shia saw that. However, when, as you know, on the 22nd of February last year, the Samarra Shrine, one of the most holy shrines for Shia, which happens to be in a Sunni city, by the way, was blown up. There was a, a, a reaction uh, which went beyond anything that the Shia religious leaders con could control. And that gave license, if you like, to Shia extremist factions to wreak havoc and start to murder in large numbers Sunni individuals just because they are Sunni. Now, the great majority of Iraqi public do not endorse this or this, but however, they are victims to both. If any family receives a, a, a slip of paper under the door saying that you've got to leave this neighborhood, Generally, people don't like to take chances with their kids and with their, with, with them, with their lives. They take the safe option. So we, we have, for, for terrorists, it's an, easy, uh, it's, it's an easy point to score. But what do these people, if it's a Shia family fleeing a Sunni neighborhood, they leave the key to their door with their Sunni neighbors. This, this is Iraq. We do not believe in hard partition, and we do not believe in soft partition. Most Iraqis want Iraq to stay whole. They want to, to uh, keep it undivided. And opinion polls back this statement. I'm not making it up. The Constitution allows decentralization because we believe decentralization enhances democracy, enhances democratic practice, and it's a guarantee against despotism in the center. However, this division must not be on sectarian basis. That has to be understood. Any province or group of provinces can form a region for the purpose of decentralized administration as it is done in this country. When the United States des to decides to make one state for Catholics and another state for Protestants, then we will consider that in Iraq. Thank you. The gentleman there.
Howard Frankie with the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, as you know, uh, some in Congress are supporting uh, benchmarks for Iraqi uh, political action, perhaps as a way of speeding up the clock. Uh, you yourself in a recent op-ed speak of uh, vigorous action on the part of the Iraqi government. I'm wondering if you could give us examples of that vigorous action that's taking place and also your view of benchmarks to speed up the clock. You probably heard about our beloved President Talabani falling ill recently and going to Jordan. <coughs> I am assured that he almost collapsed because he was conducting more than six, seven meetings a day with different groups of people, really pushing himself uh, to the limit. Uh, he and uh, the Prime Minister, Maliki, have been, working, have been working very hard to meet anybody that, uh, that has been estranged, has not joined the political process in the past, and is prepared to give up violence and join the political process. They have been working hard to talk to them, to assure them that law will be applied uh, indiscriminately. This uh, uh, recent deployment, by the way, uh, the Prime Minister pledged that it would be uh, done uh, totally indiscriminately. There is going to be no different treatment to Sunni or Shia area. Anybody who is against the law will be dealt with accordingly. Uh, we have been moving not only uh, uh, on this, we've been moving on the economic front. Uh, Iraq has set aside $10 billion for uh, smallish or medium-sized projects throughout Iraq to create work. A lot of these young people are drawn to join violent gangs, whether criminal or political, for lack of employment. Because, you know, w w w the money I was talking ab about, which was flowing into Iraq, uh, was spent on uh, engaging these uh, young people. So we want to have uh, uh, an alternative uh, for these people. And this, this has been um, uh, pushed very vigorously by various ministers. The ministers have been themselves pushed to execute their programs. We have a, a much bigger budget this year than we had last year. So the Iraqi government is, uh, is very aware of the urgency required. We are not against uh, um, benchmarks. We are not against deadlines. As I said, we should have benchmarks even for ourselves so that we can measure our progress. But we must also take into account that everything we do, we are doing under fire. We are doing in extremely difficult circumstances. And that has to be allowed for. Gentleman back. My question is very quick and very simple. Uh, and I'm sure you'll give a diplomatic reply. I wonder if you could assess and contrast, compare and contrast the performance of uh, CPA head Bremer with Ambassador Khalilizad. Uh, now, obviously, they had two different periods to deal with, but I wonder if you could give us an assessment comparing those two. You're absolutely right. I'll have to give a diplomatic answer. <laughs> Uh, you yourself uh, gave uh, part of the answer in that the two periods are different, uh, very different. Um, I have the highest regard, um, personal, even personal affection to Paul Bremer for his commitment and dedication. I believe uh, there are certain things he did wrong. I told him so at the time. But uh, he applied himself totally for the benefit of Iraq. And I think uh, we are grateful for all the good things he did. Um, uh, Zal, uh, Khalil Zad, is, is, is a different kind of person. He understands the culture. 
He built bridges with Iraqi uh, leaders uh, and gained their trust and conducted his diplomacy in a different style. Uh, but uh, underlying all this, really, is the fact that now we are partners. Iraqis and Americans have to work together and have to succeed together. Uh, the gentleman back uh, Good morning, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Tim Phelps from Newsday. Um, could you talk a little bit about what's going on in the north? With, and not as much attention has been paid there recently, but as you know, there's been a war of words between Mustafa Bozani and the, and the Turkish government. There seems to be some doubt now as to whether there will, in fact, be a referendum over Kirkuk this year. Do you expect that to happen or not? Well, uh, we as a country would like to establish the best relationship possible with our neighbors. Relationships based on mutual interest and non-interference in internal affairs. And on that principle, we believe that any interference from Turkey or from Iran or from anybody is not acceptable. We solve our problems ourselves. So that is a fundamental issue. Uh, and anything that gets in the way of it, whether it is from us or from anybody else, uh, th that's against our interest. Uh, as to the uh, question of the referendum, there was a negotiated uh, article in the Constitution, and there are uh, there is a legal structure and a political structure behind it. Whether the uh, referendum takes place or not, that will be decided, as you say in America, above my pay grade. The gentleman over there. There's a tremendous amount of disagreement, obviously, among many, many parties uh, in the States and Iraq and everywhere else uh, regarding the future. But one thing that everyone has agreed on is without electric power, there can be very little economic growth, investment, trade, and all the rest. In fact, you mentioned that in your uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. Yet it is also true that uh, drawing from reports that Tony Cordesman has done, GAO, the Spectre, Special Inspector General, the um, sabotage. Uh, against the electric power infrastructure continues. The attacks are very um, prevalent. We are now years into this process, and uh, successive ministers of electricity can't seem to get control over this. I understand that there's some renewed interest in uh, trying to get on top of this problem so that there can be some stability, especially as we are in this um, critical period. I wonder if you could speak on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, we we're facing sabotage, certainly, and we're facing corruption also. And the two things are conspiring to uh, hamper our progress. And when I talk about sabotage here, I don't uh, mean just randomized. Uh, destruction of pylons or substations or generating uh, uh, power generating stations. No. People who are doing this are absolutely well informed. They have the plans. They know where to hit to cause the maximum delay. Same with our oil pipelines. They don't hit the pipeline anywhere along the pipeline. They target valve uh, groups which are very difficult to replace, which means that they have drawings, they have details, they have intelligence. And we suspect the Mukhabarat of the previous regime who were fully well informed. Now, we are in a battle. They blow things up and we try to build them uh, up again as soon as we can. Uh, and as I said, complicating our 
uh, our uh, life is the fact that our institutions, and our government departments, do suffer from corruption. We've got to get on top of that in order to, uh, to achieve greater progress. We understand how important uh, electricity is. Without it, as you say, there can be no growth. But now, the, and, and now we, so we established a whole number of uh, smaller electric stations, but we cannot get them to work because of the fuel. So it, it's, the whole thing has to work together. Uh, and I believe we can do it, but we need more time. Honor. Can we get the microphone here, please? CSIS. Ambassador, <clears throat> you've had several government delegations in recent years that have made trips to Tehran and they appear to have established fairly good relations. And since we give you an awful lot of advice, what advice would you give us on how to cope with Iran in the coming phase of the nuclear dispute? <clears throat> well, uh, I really hesitate to give the United States advise on how to handle Iran uh, or any other country for that matter. But uh, I believe in every case um, the players have to look for mutual interests. I'm sure that I, I, by the way, I myself took part in high-level delegations in, into Iran and met top Iranian leaders, uh, like the leaders of any country, they have strategic interests, they have their worries, and they have their problems. Uh, and I think it is not beyond uh, capacity of uh, American diplomacy to identify all these and approach Iran with the package that would give it some, give Iran some assurances and some benefits, uh, not at the expense of fundamental issues, but uh, nevertheless, I think there is a lot that Iran can get out of a dialogue with the United States, uh, and there is a lot that the United States can get out of a dialogue with Iran. Uh, I don't want to uh, delve into specifics here, but the principle is very clear. Iran, I believe, despite the bravado, despite the, the public statements, I believe Iran needs the United States. Pastor, I'm going to take advantage of the position of moderator to ask you two questions. One, we've heard a great deal about rebathification and bringing more people from the Ba'ath back. I wonder if you could tell us about that. The second is the Prime Minister, when he came to office, talked about the need to find a solution to the militias, to either absorb them or abolish them, and obviously this remains a key issue, and I wonder if you could discuss that. Uh, absolutely. As, as it is the strategy of the terrorist to drive a wedge between Sunnis and Shias, it is the strategy of the government to isolate the most extreme parts of the uh, insurgents. And to do so, we've got to get those who are amenable, those who uh, have grievances which can be dealt with. I mean, Al-Qaeda we cannot negotiate with. They, they, they just want dis the destruction of the country and they want to establish their brand of extreme Islamic rule. This can, we, have, we have nothing to say to them. But there are a lot of people who, who are dis uh, disgruntled. There were army officers who, when the army was disbanded and found themselves uh, without jobs and so on, who uh, persuaded themselves or, or were persuaded with uh, uh, ideology or money to take up arms against the government. Many of those groups we can talk to and try to persuade that it's much better, they would be better off 
to be inside the tent than outside it. We're doing that. Now, debathification was a, a rule that was applied uh, in the early days. We realized that most of the Baathists were Baathists not out of conviction, but in order to survive. So debathification identified the top four layers of leadership in the Ba'ath Party and said those people will not hold public office. Now this, even, even that, which have affected something like 30, 35,000 people across the country, uh, that is being eased off. And what we are saying now is that those who committed crimes can go through the judiciary system. And those who did not, or we cannot prove that they did, can just resume their lives in the normal manner. That hopefully would diffuse that problem and would bring more people into the process. Now, the latest development is that the government has, first of all, uh, decided to give six months as a period before they bring the whole of th this regime uh, to an end. And during the six months, they allow the provinces to decide what level of leadership they keep excluding. Some uh, governorates might decide to go one level down and some others one level up. Give, in other words, give some flexibility to the to the situation and thereby uh, take out the, the sting from, from this uh, problem. The next uh, point is about, excuse me, the, uh, militias. the militias, yes. The militias uh, do represent a challenge and a threat, and we address that in the Constitution. There is an explicit reference to militias in the Constitution, which says that militias m are not allowed. Uh, th th there's a clear ban on the uh, on the carrying of arms by any organization outside the state or uh, uh, or, or is licensed by the state however we face the situation as a reality uh, this deployment this recent deployment uh, and, and the plan for Baghdad has made it clear that any militia will be targeted doesn't matter what kind of militia. And that resulted, in fact, in the melting away of militias. Well, that's good. That's what we want. Uh, this, hopefully, will give the security forces enough space and time to strengthen themselves and uh, gain control and, hopefully, prevent the return of these militias. Thank Ladies you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have time for a few last questions. Let me get to the lady in the far back there. At the Hello, Heather Moore, Kuwait News Agency. Now, I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned the term grateful in referring to uh, the Iraqi government's um, aid by the United States in, in helping with the battle. Um, but would the majority of Iraqis consider themselves grateful for the U.S. intervention? Uh, from Kuwait News Agencies? Yes, well, uh, you, I'm sure the Kuwaitis we are grateful for the intervention of the United States in 1991, so you, you would understand that. Uh, Iraqis, I think most Iraqis, the overwhelming majority of Iraqis, were desperate to get rid of Saddam Hussein, and they had lost hope after the um, failure to intervene in 1991 to remove Saddam Hussein, and started to suspect that the United States didn't really uh, we're, we're not serious about helping Iraq out of that situation. But when the United States did intervene and remove Saddam Hussein, most Iraqis were grateful for that act, and still are. However, as you know, uh, people's hopes and uh, expectations uh, were dashed. Uh, people were disillusioned. They found that uh, what happened after you know, created a mess, a much bigger mess than they, they could envisage in their worst nightmares. But the difference, the fundamental difference between Saddam period 
and now is that under Saddam there was no hope there was no horizon now despite all the trouble if you ask most Iraqis they have some hope to get out of this and of course we must not forget that the, there are whole areas of Iraq which are prospering are doing well and moving forward Kurdistan region for example is doing quite well some areas in the south are doing quite well we have some hot spots very important including Baghdad which are suffering but there is hope Saddam is gone we know we can build our own future ourselves but we need to uh, to get rid of this challenge by, as I said, terrorists and insurgents. Let me take two last questions, Lady, in the second row there. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Jennifer Hyman with CHF International. Um, I was very interested to hear how you've talked about the importance of setting aside economic resources for job creation and how that serves as a disincentive to violence. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more whether or not you think that the best U.S. assistance is military assistance or if perhaps additional economic development, political, social solutions might be a better way forward. Thank you very much. The answer is that they've got to be both in place. One is not enough. You've got to do it uh, both on the military track and, in fact, three tracks, the military track, economic track, and the political track. All of them have to work together. And that's our strategy, and that, I believe, is the strategy of the United States as well. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, it seems to me that the purpose of this forum is to bring the voice of Iraq into the debate. Uh, as you very well know, the debate up on Capitol Hill is shaped by the American opinion. Is there an effort by the Iraqi government to interject its voice directly to the American people? Well, yes, uh, there is an effort. There is an effort by their embassy, and I am ambassador of Iraq. Um, I speak as often as I can. I, from, uh, I think many uh, media producers uh, find our, our insistence a nuisance, and we keep plugging. But uh, we, we do try to get our voice out there. Uh, we have uh, frequent delegations by senior uh, officials from Iraq. We had the prime minister here, we had the president here, we had vice presidents and uh, deputy prime ministers, and we have ministers coming uh, occasionally. Uh, there is hardly uh, a week uh, that passes by without somebody from Iraq speaking to some, someone here. So we, we are engaged. There are, of course, also a lot of American journalists and media people in Iraq, uh, and they are by and large doing a good job. They are really, uh, some of them are brilliant, and they take risks, and, and they, yeah, of course they, they, they tend to cover more explosions than uh, construction projects, but that's the nature of the beast, I and mean, that's, that's, a, that's a media. But uh, they do a good job, and they bring uh, uh, our uh, views and aspirations to the American public. Uh, so they also help uh, a great deal. Uh, and we continue to, uh, uh, to bring the Iraqi perspective to the American debate. I go to, the, uh, to meet congressmen and senators almost daily. Uh, to introduce the Iraqi perspective into this debate. And this debate is, is important. We respect it. We admire it. This is a democracy. And we, after all, that's what we aspire to do ourselves. Uh, so we have no problem with it. Uh, but we just want to make sure that people, when they make decisions, are fully informed and have the broader picture in mind, not only the next election in mind. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very much for coming, but above all, I'd like to thank the ambassador, who I think has done a superb job of being the voice of the Iraqis, and I hope you'll join me in a round of applause.